to, the American Baptist Churches of New Jersey launched a new initiative, Communities in Action. This is a collaboration between ABCNJ's current New Church Development and Public Mission Committees. This partnership aspires to facilitate Christian leaders in navigating the present post-Christian pluralistic society where injustice and inequity continue to pervade while supporting one another in developing ways to respond with love and courage. These webinars are presented to help provide you with tools, a space for courageous conversations about issues surrounding our communities, and to support leaders, congregations, and faith groups in the work towards justice and human rights to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and be peacemakers in our world. Thank you for joining us in this new collaboration. Okay, got that. Um, <laughs> excited to just share what's been uh, really uh, what's been going on in terms of mission uh, that uh, that going on in, in, in this part of New Jersey, uh, but also excited to hear what's going on in yours as well. And I hope that this is a collaborative uh, experience. And uh, I will share a little bit more towards the end, but just want to put it out there that uh, this is not just a strictly a webinar kind of experience, you know, that is not just uh, one way informational kind of uh, experience, but that through uh, tonight that we will be able to engage in smaller groups uh, of communities, communities in action, cohort groups, where we will have smaller groups of three to five pastors, three to five leaders or pioneers um, just sharing uh, the journey of mission together. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but I just wanna put it out there right now, but so excited for this time and excited uh, about what God is going to do and doing already and uh, leading us, inviting us into. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, it's great to see you all. I'm thankful to be here with all of you this evening. Excited for for what our, our speaker has to say this evening to us. So I have the privilege and honor of introducing our illustrious speaker this evening, uh, the Reverend Travis Norvell. I don't know if I pronounced that right, so you you can correct me if I didn't. Um, one tidbit he didn't share, but I'm just guessing off the top of my head is that his favorite song is by Queen, I Want to Ride My Bicycle. Um, I Want to Ride My Bike. Um, if you don't know, he's on Twitter as the Pedaling Pastor. He's the pastor of Judson Memorial Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the adjunct professor, uh, faculty member at United Theological Seminary uh, of the Twin Cities, he served as an American Baptist pastor for 22 years in both small towns and urban churches. Um, he's passionate about the social gospel in the local church um, as a link for both social justice and church renewal. So uh, if you guys didn't get the book, here it is. So take it away, Travis. Well, thanks for, um, thanks for being here, everyone. This is, um, this is technically uh, the first church gig uh, I've had with this um, uh, presentation, so happy to be here with everyone. Uh, hold on, I just lost something right there. Um, there we go. All right. And I know David said you're going to be able to see the top of the uh, Google Doc piece, but just hang with me on that. So uh, first church gig, there's been quite a few uh, instances I've spoken with other uh, organizations about this. And it's been interesting, I think, that um, there's been less church interest than there has been in community interest. So I found that kind of interesting. So this is fun. I did speak with a group of Quaker pastors uh, a couple weeks ago on this book, but I don't know if you ever spoke with a group of Quaker pastors, but there's a lot of grunting. There weren't many questions. Uh, and they didn't really say much. So um, I hope that you all will be a little bit different than that. Um, you can grunt if you want to, but um, 
we'll see how that goes. But thanks again. Thanks for your executive minister, uh, Reverend Miriam Menendez and Reverend, uh, Reverend Pastor uh, Mia Chang and uh, Pastor Randy uh, Van Austin. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, name, pronunciation, if you really want to know, it's, it's Norval, like Norval Redenbacher. That was what uh, everybody said to me as a kid. So that's fine. But I'll, I'll answer to both, right? They're both barely off. So thanks for everybody uh, for being here. And um, well, let's get started. So this is trying to link what I think through the two greatest things that you can link together, church renewal and social justice. So I think you all uh, got the book and I really appreciate you for uh, taking, a, taking a gander at it. And if you haven't finished it tonight, uh, I, you know, I hope you stay up till 2 a.m. finishing it and uh, uh, enjoy it all very much. I didn't say so in the book. You'll never see this in the uh, book, but it, it's really based on Psalm 8510, you know, let love and faithfulness meet together, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Um, and that's really kind of the basis of the book. How do you, how do you have church renewal and social justice kiss each other? You know, how do they uh, partner up? And that's really what we're trying to think about and trying to explore. And that's what's going to happen um, throughout this today. So I hope that you see those two coming together. And the fact that um, that you all are linking together new church development and you know public Christian witness is just amazing. So uh, thanks upon thanks for this opportunity. And here we go. So we're going to first start off with why do these two, you know, what I think are beautiful things, never really put together. So I don't know if you know, um, this book by Paul Nixon. I mean, it's got a great title, I Refuse to Lead a Dying Church. And it, it's got some great stuff in the book. I really appreciate it. Um, but, you know, the, here's this quote that he has, you know, you, these are kind of like these mantra that he has in the book that you repeat them and somehow they, they, these mag magical things will happen if you say this. But, you know, you hereby refuse to help your church gracefully into the grave and you hereby refuse to channel your best ministry energy into community or justice endeavors that are detached from your congregation's life and ministry. You know, and I just ask you know, why does this dichotomy exist? You know, behind that question is, you know, plenty of pastors who are, you know, at the drop of a hat will be at a protest, or plenty of pastors who, if you ask them to, you know, coach a little league game will be there. Uh, you know, people that are involved in the community ministry, in their community, or people that are involved in justice endeavors, but somehow they're detached from the congregation's life. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the, where this question or this you hereby uh, is coming from. But I really want to know why is it, why do churches come, why do churches think like that? Why can't your social justice be a part of your church renewal? And why aren't they the same? Uh, and that's what we're really trying to figure out and really trying to uh, delve at. And so I think, you know, this is the 1970s, you know, uh, first TV commercial for Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, right? I mean, why can't it be peanut butter and chocolate together? And uh, I think they are. So here we go. But we know there's problems. We know there's great problems. Um, you know, this is what happens, right? We have churches that are for sale or closing. I mean, just since, you know, in the pandemic 10 in South Minneapolis, and these aren't just kind of uh, churches that were dying to begin with. I mean, these were UCC and ELC, you know, Evangelical Lutherans, United Methodists, Episcopalian. These were churches with big endowments and, you know, kind of committed folk, but they just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, the churches kind of just didn't have the energy, and they just said, we can't do it. They closed, they sold their buildings. Or you see the fact that like all of us are probably, you know, just needing a break uh, on the urge, of, you know, on that edge of burnout and just wondering about where things are going. Um, and here's, you know, uh, you know, Howard John Wesley at Alfred Street Baptist in DC saying that he needed a, uh, a season of just rest because he couldn't, he couldn't do much anymore. Uh, so these are our challenges. But here we go. Um, I just want to share with you a couple of things. Everything I'm going to share with you tonight, probably 90% of it, you already know. Uh, it's already in there somewhere uh, in those wonderful, beautiful minds of yours. Uh, all I'm really going to do is just remind you of these things and encourage you to go out and do them in a more active way. Um, so this is Urban T. Holmes. He was the uh, dean of the Swanee School of Theology. He died tragically of a heart attack at age 51. 
uh, he was a dean there and he's a church historian. And he wrote this book kind of on ministry um, that he was looking at in the late 60s and just said, you know, for 1900 years, it was assumed that we, the church, knew what we should be doing. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of times we think that we, we know what we should be doing uh, or move, people make the assumption of that or we make the assumption. Uh, but then you go to try to practice the model of ministry that you have, that you grew up with or that you inherited, and it just doesn't seem to work now. Uh, you run into roadblocks. They're just things don't work like they used to. And there's all kinds of reasons. and There's all kinds of solutions. But this is just my approach on how do we change things? How do you get started? How do you renew? I like to start with Arthur Ashe. He's the person I go to uh, quite a bit in these things. And his life kind of rule or his life mantra, right? Start where you are. Use what you have and do what you can. Uh, we can just start there. And what is the most thing that most of you have? Uh, most of you have a parking lot. So I want to start at a parking lot. Uh, I want to start at a parking lot. I, um, Miriam did send me the um, addresses, you know, of a Google map of the entire uh, ABC New Jersey. And so I spent a good part of one afternoon kind of zooming in and out on Google Maps, your churches, um, got all kind of good information on the churches uh, that I could get from you. Uh, either looks like about 95% of you have a parking lot and those that don't have a parking lot do seem to be either on a bike line, a bike lane or right near a public transit line. So those are both great things. But let's talk about parking lots, uh, which seems like a counterintuitive place to start. But I think it's the opening of all kinds of things. So start where you are. This is a parking lot. Uh, most of you probably have some parking, like I said, but for a moment, for a moment, can we just ponder what a parking lot is? Now, I, I want you to envision you standing in your parking lot, your church's parking lot, or the parking lot uh, closest to you. Now, more than likely, before it was a parking lot, there was probably a house or a business that once stood there. It was probably something else than for the temporary storage of automobiles. In many ways, it was a horizontal wall that separated you. It is now a horizontal wall that separates you from your neighbors and your community. So how can you use this parking lot to open up the community and, and open yourself up to the neighbors in your community to have be in more relationship with them and to establish some kind of community with them. Now, this is a kind of two models. You know, how can we move from a parking lot, think of it more as a plaza, which is a multi-use, rather than a parking lot, which is a limited use. Now, this the picture that you have on your left, this is a, there isn't a parking lot yet that encapsulates my vision for what a parking lot should be, but we're all getting there. Uh, instead, the closest I can get to you, I can show you, uh, is, a, is a Dutch street concept called a Wunroff. Um, people first, cars second design. Now, oppose this uh, Dutch street with Eagle Brook Church in Woodbury, Minnesota, right? I mean, look at that. It's giant. That whole, everything about it's giant. Um, that is a parking lot first, people second design. So how do, can you reimagine re your parking lot? as a people first place of land. And then as a car, second, as a temporary storage of automobiles, second. At most, you know, uh, your, your parking lot's probably fully used about six hours a week. Now, across, uh, maybe two and a half blocks from me uh, is the second largest evangelical Lutheran church in North America. And about a mile from me is the largest evangelical church in North America. And what I like to do is ride by uh, throughout the day and take pictures of their parking lot and see how much it's used. And even the first and second largest evangelical Lutheran churches in North America, their parking lots are used about six hours a week, full. So here's just a thing. What would a parking lot look like then if it wasn't just for the temporary storage of automobiles? You can grow food in, your, in a parking lot. At Straw Bell Garden, you can see the uh, parking lot where the people have grown, started growing food, a bike course to help people learn how to ride bikes. Uh, just as a side note, 
bike group rides that start at churches or libraries rather than at bike shops have about uh, a 50% greater attendance than if you just started at a bike shop. So just think about that. A labyrinth painted with or with chalk or just a drop cloth that's out there. Uh, asking a blood mobile to come and park in your parking lot and serve the community. Uh, Saturday morning farmers markets hosted in church parking lots. Movie or band nights in church parking lots. Tiny homes in church parking lots. Now, here's one thing about housing that um, is, is a possibility now. Because of housing regulations and zoning regulations, church parking lots can operate almost um, free of a lot of the zoning regulations uh, in other areas of your city. And now we have in Minneapolis and St. Paul and the surrounding areas, uh, people are building these little tiny, you know, these tiny homes, 100, 200 square foot homes in parking lots to help with those who are experiencing homelessness, uh, veterans who are experiencing homelessness. Um, they're able to build them in their church parking lots because it's the only place uh, that the zoning laws cannot touch. So just kind of have that in the back of your mind. Uh, basketball, you know, basketball hoops in church parking lots are a great uh, thing to do. So how can you use your parking lot to address ideas of health justice or food justice or housing justice? All these things are there available for you in the parking lot. And I'm using a parking lot just as a, a starter because in the book, I talk a lot about the same ways you can do this in your building, but you can do it in your parking lot. Um, so let's talk about, so metaphors though, if you, if you change your parking lot idea, um, Joseph Campbell had this great quote, you know, if you want to change the world, change your metaphor, you know, change the story. Uh, so what is our metaphor for a church? You know, for, for 500 years, the Protestant Reformation has given us this mighty fortress metaphor of the church. And, you know, I don't, I don't know about, I've looked at online at some of your churches, what they look like. They're beautiful, right? I mean, they're, my, my church was designed after kind of an English castle. Uh, and English castles are great, you know. Uh, but if the French ever decide to invade, you know, it says that we're ready for them. Uh, hopefully that's not the case, but we're there for them if the French do decide to come across the border. But Pope Francis has given us a different image, not a fortress. You know, instead, he said, can the church be a field hospital? Can the church be the place that's out there in the community, open and vulnerable? Uh, and, and here he is, you know, a church that's bruised and hurting and dirty because it's out on the street rather than a church which is in unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. Okay, but, but how do you get outside? You know, these are great words, they're beautiful, but how do you become a field hospital? Or how do, you, how do you get outside your church? This is where the movement or the church on the move kind of idea comes from. You get out by just doing the things that you can do kind of naturally. Walking, biking, take a scooter, take the bus, take the light rail, subway. Or if you're getting a car, if you do ride in your car, I ask you one thing. Always have somebody with you. Um, don't, let, don't, go some, don't go places by yourself. Uh, either ask someone from your church to go with you someone from the community just to uh, go with you on a visit. Or if you don't have uh, access to a car, I ask that a lot of times uh, I'll just say, hey, are you gonna go you know, take some rolls to Carl? If so, can I ride with you? Uh, it, it, and it enables you two things. It gives you a, a um, kind of a natural visit with the person that you're riding with. And then you get to visit with the people that you're, or the person that you're visiting. So you get a kind of a, it's a twofer um, all the way around. And for me, riding a bike, walking, taking public transit, is just the way to get out into your neighborhood. You know, it's the access to uh, enable you to be around people. And if you need like a song, you know, have in your head, you know, the, the Sesame Street song, the people in your neighborhood. Oh, who are the people in your neighborhood? Yeah, your neighborhood. You know, just have that song in your head all the time as you're trying to introduce yourself to the people in your neighborhood and just by walking around. Now, uh, you're, you're going to meet people just by just getting outside, uh, sitting on your church steps. Um, sometimes I'll just go on the church steps and have coffee and just to see the people that come by. Now, I do live in you know, South Minneapolis is pretty uh, a safe place. I do realize that's not everybody's case, but I mean, we, the church has 
people have tried to set the church on fire before and we have you know been graffitied and um you know sometimes you have to run some people off the steps because of what they're doing so i realize not every place is the same but um try to make yourself be present as possible as much as possible one of our uh, colleagues um Mindy Welton Mitchell, she's now the executive minister for uh, American Baptist Churches, Wisconsin. This was her idea, which was just to have outside office hours for um, one day a week. She would just go outside, post it on social media. Hey, I'm going to be out here serving coffee uh, from you know 12 to 2 or 2 to 4. Come by with any questions and uh, see what happens. There is, a, there is a guy in Manhattan at a Lutheran church that he has the peanuts kind of idea and it says the pastor is in and it's 25 cents and uh, people come by and ask him all kinds of things. Um, we'll go from there. So, Hey, uh, I want to just pause for a second and just ask, see if there's any, um, see if there are any questions or, uh, cause we're going to already transition to something else, but anything, um, any questions come out after you right now for this moment, anybody? Okay, we'll move on. So um, at, at once you're out uh, trying to find out who's in your community, uh, one of the things you gotta think about is, um, you know, the, the church has generally, Paul Tillich once said that, you know, the church, the culture asks questions and the church answers them. Uh, that it seems like a lot of times, you know, the church is answering questions that no one's asking, uh, which which can be, um, you know, kind of a circular thing. We just keep answering questions that no one's answering and, then and wondering why no one is paying any attention to us. Uh, rather than um, have the, your brightest minds of your church come together and, and come together with an idea of how we're going to uh, reinvigorate the church, why not just go out and ask the community? what they need, what's on their hearts and minds, uh, what are their thoughts. And this is, a, this is an idea simply called four questions. Um, you know, think about it. You have two ears, two eyes, two nostrils, two hands, and only one mouth. You know, I think God is trying to tell us something here. Uh, too many times we think we have the answers uh, when, our, when our real uh, gift is to receive and to listen. So how can you listen to your community but do it in an intense and intentional way. This is one-on-one -on -one conversations. Now, my goal a few years ago was to do 110 one-on-one -on -one conversations in celebration of Judson's 110th birthday. Uh, I got to somewhere between 47 and 62. It depends on how you count. Uh, and then the pandemic came. And one thing you can be rest assured, people love to talk and to be heard. And here is your chance to let them talk and to listen to them. Now, for the record, I need to give complete um, uh, credit to this. You know, I got this idea from one of your region staff members, you know, David Van Brakel gave me this idea. So um, if you would like some more information on it, he's even got uh, more stuff. So if, if you don't know where to start, you know, like how, do you, how would you start asking your community? You know, I ask, I start with someone at your coffee shop, at your laundromat, you know, at the, who is your block captain? For me, I started with our neighborhood organizer that we have, and I, I called her on the phone and I said, Sarah, I've got, I'd like to just get with you for coffee, and I've got some questions I'd like to ask, and she was right on it. Um, and the most important question after you figure out your four questions is, um, who would you recommend that I talk to next? That's going to be the most important one. Now, I, I like to call this a true pyramid scheme. Uh, and it's not a Ponzi scheme or um, like an Amway scheme, but scheme and the uh, idea. And you know, if you go to the UK, they will say, uh, you know, we have our new transit scheme. Uh, and at first I thought, wow, what, what kind of goofy thing is this? But no, scheme just meaning plan. So this is a true pyramid scheme. One person, that's you, asks another person to talk to, and then they give you recommendations. And you just kind of multiply out you can go as deep and as far and wide as you want to with this. And these are the four questions that I came up with. Now, your questions are going to be different. They're, you're going to find for your own circumstance and your own community. But this is what I came up with. Um, do you know where Judson Church is located? 
you know, uh, the Judson Church that I serve, everyone thought that everybody knew everything about it in the community. Uh, and I found out that people that live on the other side of the alley had no idea where we were. Uh, one guy said, hey, I love your yellow Adirondack chairs you have in your front yard of the church. Uh, and I was like, you mean currently? He said, yes, I, I just jogged by him the other day and I love him. And I thought, huh, you know, we don't have a yard. There's no greenery on our church at all. And we don't have yellow Adirondack chairs. Uh, what he meant was the Episcopal church about a half a mile away. It was a great compliment for me to think that people thought we were Episcopalian. I mean, they make a lot more money than we do, but um, that wasn't the case. The other thing you can do if you don't know, the other thing, you, a little experiment you can do is just find someone in the community that you don't know and just say, hey, I'm lost. Can you give me directions to Judson Church or to your church? And see if they can even give you directions. Uh, the other thing is, do you know anything about Judson Church? And what we found out through this was, Everybody loved our playground, but nobody really had any idea that we were a church. We were a playground that had a church attached to it, um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the other thing was, you know, for me, I asked, what is your biggest worries about life, at living in this neighborhood? And then finally, it was, if you had a chance to tell the church where they should direct their energies, what would you wish that they would focus on? Uh, I, I was blown away by how honest people were in this um, and just the earnest uh, nature that people gave us and you know this shaped really our ministries and how we're what we're thinking about doing as a church uh, this is this is where this stuff came from for us um, but I know that everyone thinks okay uh, do we have enough time you know as a as an institution to kind of do this approach you know you may think I've only got you know, this church is barely hanging on or we, the energy we just don't have. And you think that time's running out. Uh, but there's all kinds of ways that you can um, think about time. Yes, time's running out on all of us. Uh, just act with urgency. There's still time. There's always time to create and to step out and to make new relationships. Pardon me. It's just a matter of, you know, just act with a sense of urgency. Uh, one thing I, I find it, that, that the church I serve, yes, they agree that time's running out, but that sense of urgency, uh, I wish they had it a little bit sooner, but they're starting to get there. Uh, they're starting to get there. So act with some urgency. I'd also like to free to act with uh, a sense of taking a risk. Uh, now, this is a, a great op-ed that was written by a comedian in New York City, Emily Winter. Uh, and it was simply a hundred of the time I got rejected a hundred and one times. Now think about all the times in your life that you have been rejected. Uh, probably not the most thing you want to think about right now, but uh, she found that, that by taking risks, um, doing things that maybe she thought she couldn't do, she was able to put herself out there in a way that enabled her to do more and more and more. So I, as a church right now, you, you have to take risks. You can't play it safe. You got to risk messy conversations, risk failing, risk putting yourself out there. I would say risk people actually wanting to hear what you have to say. People do want to hear this, the good news and the good word that you have. Uh, they want to hear about God's transformation, uh, redemption, second chances. Uh, they want to hear that, to risk that they really do. Um, now, you may be thinking about now, hey, I thought this was about social justice. Uh, I haven't heard anything about social justice. Well, I would say this is what I call indirect social justice. Uh, we're kind of coming around it from the side. So if, if you are involved in the community, having conversations, listening, then you're involved in social justice. You're gonna, your heart's going to be broken in so many ways. You're going to be involved in social justice. Now, you know, just yesterday, it was two years since the murder of George Floyd. Uh, we're, the church is about a mile and a half from George Floyd Square. I live about a mile and a half uh, from the square, also in a di different direction. Now, when that happened, you know, the city was turned upside down. You know, the city was burning. There was needs everywhere. Uh, and because of the conversations that myself and the church had, you know, we knew where to respond. And we knew where the resources that were available, who to partner with, who needed help. 
you know, and, and it also these conversations had started us on a trajectory of you know, kind of long term change that we need to be uh, making for ourselves from the inside out. So you may not think that this approach is a social justice approach, but it, it's indirect. It will put you there in a very specific way. Uh, you know, I just ask this, that when you're learning to do ministry like this as a church, I know that we're all tired. I know that we're all burnt out. Uh, I know that things are exhausting. And when you get in that way, you, you, you want to almost close up, you know, and right now, if you can, just, just in one hand, make a fist, and on the other hand, open your hand and just feel the difference in the two of them. You know, you're never going to change someone by, by, with a fist. You're going to change someone with an open hand. And when you are on the steps of your church, listening to stories, you're going to have your heart broken. You, you know, your hand's going to be open. You're going to be uh, there in the midst of people. Um, and you, you don't have to, you know, open hand is also, you don't have to do this all by yourself. You know, uh, ask people for partnerships. Ask people in your community to help you. Um, we have someone we, uh, on our church board. You know, we just asked for a, a member of the community. Would you come and be on our church board just so we can hear what you have to say? What do you think is, you know, when we're talking on a church council, does anything we say make any sense? Uh, does it seem like it's going to be uh, welcome to those on the outside? Um, and also to also say that, you know, sometimes you may be understaffed as a church, but, you know, we're finding that, you know, the staff is probably sitting in your pews, retired, bored, just waiting to be asked to do something. Uh, we've had staff people that, you know, they're, they're volunteers. They'll come in for six months, but, you know, they're, we ask them to do a task. They, they fulfill the task for six months, and then they go on to something else, but it just gives us uh, a great wealth of resources that are there in our uh, community. And finally, you know, I just want to look at this uh, picture. This is the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Tutu. I mean, the smiles that they have on their face. Uh, you know, ministry and church life should fill us with smiles, but a lot of times it doesn't. It kind of wears us out. So I find that when I ride a bike, when I'm walking, when I'm on public transit, I smile a lot because I'm just around people, hearing some good stories. And yes, some of them are, are heartbreaking but some of them are just, just lighten the load. Um, they just make life a little bit easier. Uh, and sometimes when I've had a really bad church meeting, I also find that, you know, by riding my bike to, how, to home, uh, by the time I get home, I've kind of ridden off all the anxiety. Things are a little bit better too. So you'd be healthier. You'll be more joyful. You'll be more tender uh, by doing this kind of approach to ministry. Putting yourself out there. Yes, you're going to be vulnerable. Yes, you're going to make some mistakes, uh, but you're going to make some new relationships. And these new relationships are going to change you, and they're going to change the way that you uh, pastor a church.